This screencast is designed to introduce uh, the play Jerusalem by Jez Butterworth to my new AS class, starting in September of 2015. It's designed to look at the pastoral ideas that lie behind and throughout this play. And I think I will move fairly widely over a range of areas, um, certainly in terms of the pastoral here. I'm looking to begin with at this idea of the god Pan, the Greek god Pan, who ruled in an area of the Peloponnese called Arcadia, and who is the god of misrule, the god of music, the god of all fertility, is a character who can be seen in the central character of the play. Rooster Byron is going to um, dominate a lot of the uh, screencasts that I make on this play, and uh, I hope that I will establish links, but also create thought in the minds of those listening. Simply, the pastoral is a movement which celebrates simplicity in life, um, perhaps seeking the unsophisticated, perhaps seeking to be removed from modernity, whether that's the horrors of modernity or just modernity, is in a sense up to you. And in terms of English literature, it's probably best seen in the Georgian movement that um, started before World War I, like extended after it, of poets, musicians, seeking to get away from the horrors. That said, it's worth pointing out that poets like Owen were published in Georgian um, magazines, as with any movement or any genre, there is a mixture, and it is the mixture, perhaps, that gives anything its validity in that way. Way past the idea of English literature, going back in time, we should also look at the writings of the Roman poet Virgil, um, who wrote a series of poems, his Eclogues, as an introduction of introducing uh, the idea of a golden age to celebrate the arrival of Augustus, and a passing reference, therefore, roughly, well, not really roughly, but somewhere between the two, to uh, Voltaire, the French philosopher writer, who, in his picaresque novel Candide, eventually, after putting the characters through an incredible range of totally implausible suffering and situations, lets them gather together under the banner of Let Our Garden Grow. Themes, therefore, of the pastoral, you could pause and jot these down, would probably be a good idea. Nostalgia for a past which is generally idealised, and a refuge from modernity. Perhaps a seeking for a lost innocence, transience and decay. A contrast, generally, and a tension, therefore, between retreat and the modern civilised society. And as a journey, perhaps, in which we return from our pastoral setting, a wiser and a better person. And it's these themes that I'm going to explore, amongst others, as we carry on talking. As ever, as students at this level, you need to have an awareness of uh, critical voices. I'm looking here to send you off to find writing of Roger Sales, Lawrence Lerner, and uh, Sales, rather conveniently, has his five R's, if you like, of the pastoral refuge, reflection, return, requiem, reconstruction. And if you think about it, that establishes also a, a chronological process by which we might look at um, the pastoral. Likewise, Lerner here, this idea that the golden age in some way sums up this whole idea of wish fulfilment. Interesting. So the Golden Age, worth talking about since we've started to uh, go in that direction. First presented really as an idea by Virgil, um, both in Eclogue 4 and Aeneid 6. Generally as part of propaganda surrounding Augustus' rule, uh, Rome had been torn apart by decades of civil war. The arrival of the emperor, whilst not loved by everybody, uh, did give a moment where peace could be judged to have settled on Rome, even if not on the rest of the empire, and hence a golden age could be in place. Now Virgil was taking this idea from a writer who, unless you are somebody who has explored the early classical writings, is far less known. This is the writing of Hesiod, 
um, who had posited the idea of five ages of man, beginning in the golden age of man and gods, um, and deriving by the time Hesiod wrote in about the 7th century um, BC, the Iron Age, mankind, everything has been debased, and so this idea of transience and decay is brought to the fore. There's no doubt that the pastoral tends to dream of recapturing this sun-drenched world of childhood. Um, often it, the writing is, is overly romanticised, or, yeah, it's overly romanticised. The, 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 the horrors, if you like, of a true pastoral are rarely encountered. This tag, et in Arcadia Ego, um, a Latin tag, some of you may well have come across it if you've read Evelyn Waugh's Brideshead Revisited. If you haven't, add it to your book list. And it reflects this idea that Arcadia, the, the home of the god Pan, has become, if you like, a, a generic term for the idyllic rural retreat. Uh, it is the name of a painting by Poussin, which is on the next slide, and I'll talk about it over that, because... What's rather nice about this idea, here you see the, the painting, um, whether these people are nymphs, satyrs, they're none of these things, they seem to really be, visit, be, be ordinary inhabitants of a, of a rural ideal, but they're at a gravestone. And this idea of et in Acadio, Acadia Ego is an interestingly double-faced. The meaning is vague. Anybody who studied Latin will see that the uh, verb is missing from the phrase. And it could be a wistful looking back. Et in Acadia ego. Once upon a time I was even in Arc Arcadia, it says, this dead man perhaps sending a message that, you know, even, even the dead once lived in happens. Of course, the other message of it is that even in Arcadia, I am. In other words, death lurks even in the most beautiful of places. And in this case, it's a rather difficult warning, I think, that is being uh, taken, even in bliss, even in an, idyll, in an idyll, there is something unpleasant. And this ties in with the next theme, motive of the pastoral, that of the garden, and specifically the Garden of Eden. Um, if we accept that we're looking at Eden in the prelapsarian state of innocence, Adam and Eve are there and they live this blameless life involving sex. If you haven't read Paradise Lost, read it, there's plenty of it. Um, and gardening, and they help maintain the garden. But the interesting thing is that the snake that will be inhabited by Satan is already there. There is some sense that even in bliss, the negative exists. Some sense of a predetermined battle between innocence and experience. I don't want to digress into Paradise Lost, but the idea that God has made paradise, but he has put into paradise the means for Satan to cause the fall of man, suggests some form of predeterminism for some readers. The garden, when it appears, is often presented through a mist of regret, a mist, a mist of longing to return to the state of innocence. At the centre of Arcadia, we find Pan. Pan, the god of riot, of rustic music. He's a companion to the nymphs. He's a god of fertility. He's the god of spring, of rebirth. And links, undoubtedly, in some respects, to this multifaceted character of Johnny. He is the undoubted god of his rural glade. He seems attractive to the nymphs, or does he? It's interesting to note that he is surrounded by youth, young girls and boys, who seem to have no sexual encounter with him, however much they might want it with each other. He seems very definitely to be a lord of riot and misrule, a lord of destruction. Interestingly, though, he's not in ultimate control, and he is certainly defeated and humiliated by Troy, even if not by the council, given the way the ending is left, in the same way that Pan would ultimately not 
have total control over his world in the Greek pantheon. And at this point, you might want to engage in some, some reading, some thought processes. And if you are, one of the things that you might want to do is to look and see what you can find regarding Johnny as a pan-like character in this play. The innocents around are, are interesting. The, the one that I want to just focus on, and what, since we're looking at Arcadia and Greece in this context, is, is Phaedra, uh, the 15-year-old girl who opens the play, although, of course, none of us know that's who she is for quite a long time. But it is a name of ill omen in ancient Greece, although the name means bright. Phaedra, the character of myth, will die accused of an incestuous relationship with, well, her, her son, um, by Theseus. Her role in the play is mysterious. She appears little. She is used in the third act, I would argue, to establish a, a sense of innocence between herself and Johnny when they, they talk and they dance. She's undoubtedly hiding from something. She doesn't seem to be being kept prisoner in any way or anything of that sort of nature. But she is given the song that opens the play, the, the singing of Blake's Jerusalem. Since, therefore, the play carries this name, and since that poem is an exploration of the effects, if you like, of industry and urbanisation on the pastoral, she is a character who has to be given due weight, and you will need to think carefully about Phaedra, even though she appears so little. Now, pastoral is all very well, and it's one thing to write about pastoral issues, shall we say, when industry is growing and the rural life is being destroyed and so on, and we look back on it in that sense of joy. But I think it's worth considering the more recent schools of anti and post pastoral. Not all pastoral reflects unstinting praise on the rural way of life. And whilst here I've suggested on this um, slide that you look back at a time before and do some research on Blake, you certainly should do. But I think we can begin to take comments from one or two more recent writers, uh, Terry Gifford being one here, who I quote saying the natural world can no longer be constructed as a land of dreams, but is in fact a bleak battle for survival without divine purpose. Now, if we take that and we, we take this, then we can link this clearly to a movement that started in the 18th century, that of the anti-pastoral. Poets like Stephen Duck, a Wiltshireman, John Clare from Northampton, presented reality and social criticism in place of a simplistic rural idyll. Um, I quote here a, a, a line from Clare's Village Minstrel, Every village owns its tyrants now, and parish slaves must live as parish kings allow. This idea that as the enclosures of the 18th century happened, the freedom to live, to farm, and to live, if you like, a rural idyllic life was restricted. But it was restricted down to village level. It was restricted in such a way that even at the level of the basic man, rights were infringed. I think, again, at this point, you would always want to be reading around, and I list here some writers that you might want to just have a look at. Ted Hughes, great poet, a great nature poet, but a poet in whom, in whose writings nature is cruel and harsh and unforgiving. Uh, John Clare, I've just talked about. Look at Seamus Heaney, particularly the early poems, uh, the poems about his childhood growing up on a farm in Northern Ireland, and again, look at the way nature is presented as being engaged with by man, if you like. Look at Blake, The Songs of Innocence and Experience. Look also at Hardy. You don't have to read the great novels, although you probably should have done, at least in some cases by now. But the plight of the rural poor was something that Hardy felt strongly. Nobody can read Tess without being moved by the fate of the potato pickers, of the reality of the rural life, which was that if you had no home over your head and no gainful employment in the winter months, you would die. It is as simple as that. 
my class will be looking at these divided up and they'll be presenting their findings back to the class. As time has moved on, things have changed again and the rise of eco-criticism has perhaps um, engendered what we're beginning to call post-pastoral. This is, if you like, a looking at pastoral which is well aware that the term pastoral can be seen as a pejorative, as a negative, and has lost that sense of idyll about it. This is a pastoral which looks at the effect and awareness of the environmental impact of actions on the countryside and on the planet as a whole. The effect of migration from countryside to urban centres, the growth of rural weekenders perhaps would all form part of this discussion in terms of this play when we look at the wish to destroy the wood to build houses. These are all areas that we are aware of. The contexts have become very important. Again, Critic Watch, you'll be looking out for the writing of Lawrence Buell as we read. In this world, we're not solely concerned with, with, with the human condition, if you like. Um, Gifford writing again, now with much as interest in the welfare of Arden as in that of its exiled inhabitants. He's using Arden here as the English forest, of course, that Shakespeare um, writes about, particularly in As You Like It. But there is this, this sense here that we are, when we're reading the pastoral, having to look at the interaction between human and forest and and if we don't do that, we are somehow missing the point. Gifford has provided us with a useful post-pastoral um, checklist, if you like. Nature is something that we should be in awe of. We should be recognising a continuing cycle of birth, death, construction, destruction, winter to spring to summer and so on. We should be recognising that our inner human nature can somehow be understood in relation to the outer workings of nature. We move from nature as culture towards culture as nature, remembering that everything is going to return to earth in the end. The fact that we might see buildings in some way as being the man-made equivalents of trees, yet they still will fall, they still will decay, they still will rot, and once they have rotted, what will be there? Well, nature, again. Uh, many of you read the poems City Planners um, as part of your IGCSE. Might be worth just looking again at the ideas that we see in there. Number five develops the idea that as we become more conscious of what we're doing, thus our conscience is pricked, and so consciousness breeds conscience. And finally, this idea that the exploitation of the planet can be mirrored in the human exploitation of gender and race. As we read, you will need to keep a checklist of the pastoral, the anti, the post, to help you fit the play into this genre if it does. The other thing that I want to look at, and will form the basis of the next discussion, is the form of tragic comedy that um, was a feature of all ancient Greek drama festivals. Those are the satyr plays. You can read what it says on the screen, and satyr plays will form part of the next discussion. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope that this talk has been 